Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us for our ninth Brussels Forum. Uh, we're joined tonight by the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Lithuania, Mr. Lynn Kavich. Lynn Kavich. Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, we just heard from the Acting Foreign Minister of Ukraine, Andrei Dushitsa. Also behind me, we have the Chairman for the Parliament of Georgia, David Yushapashvili. Um, and then Chairman Ukraine Democratic Alliance for Reform, Zatili Kletschka. And then Kurt Volker, former U.S. Ambassador to NATO. So the gentlemen have some opening statements, brief statements, and then we'll open the floor to questions. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, good evening. Uh, just a few words. Uh, when we started the Eastern Partnership Program before the Lithuanian presidency in July last year, there were some skeptics saying that it's very difficult, challenging, and probably this program will be over soon. But they, they were right, partly, because there were a lot of challenges. Uh, we, we, know, we know what we're talking about. But I'm really clearly say now, and also in presence of these uh, friends, gentlemen here, uh, we are really continuing. Uh, well, with, all, with all these difficulties, just one, one remark to you, uh, just to, to share with you. Uh, it's clearly uh, now obvious to, obvious to many of us that uh, the choice of the countries, it's not enough just to respect that choice, but sometimes it's important also to defend that choice. And it's not a problem of those partners, but sometimes also it's a matter of fact for us it's important. So I have no doubt that we'll continue. Maybe there will be difficulties ahead, but we are optimists and we will have a very good uh, future in cooperation together. Good evening. Um, we did expect that Ukrainian Prime Minister Arseniy Yatsenyuk would be here today with uh, us, but unfortunately he uh, left uh, to Ukraine uh, earlier today after uh, signing the association agreement to take a uh, um, uh, situation in, in Ukraine. Actually, not only in Ukraine, but uh, around Ukraine. And really, what is uh, we feel that uh, the uh, uh, deployment of Russian troops in our eastern borders and the intensity of activities in the Crimea needs uh, a special attention. But what's uh, happened today is I think it's very important for the Ukrainian, uh, uh, for Ukrainians, for Ukrainian state, but also for Europe, it, the uh, signing of the political part of the association agreement. It's a very good sign in what directions uh, Ukraine has to go. Thanks. Well, we in Georgia, we are expressing our solidarity to Ukrainian people so many times during the last several months. And we were sharing the sufferings we were watching from Georgia. And today, finally, I have the reason not to express solidarity, but to congratulate to our friends in Ukraine with designing this very important document, after which the journey towards wider Europe becomes irreversible. And believe us, dear Ukrainians, we Georgians are not jealous that you were first signing this document because we will follow. The most important thing is to continue our part together, that we need to stay together and we need to prove that Eastern Europe is just Europe. And Europe is the gathering of free nations, free countries, free citizens. And these problems we are witnessing now in Ukraine and in Georgia are temporary problems. And today during this uh, conference, we heard many encouraging words that the world, democratic world, is ready to respond. Unfortunately, that was not the case. In August 2008, if that was the case, probably our Ukrainian friends would not suffer now, but better later than never, as it is said. And therefore, I am full of optimism now, and we are sharing the feelings of Ukrainian people today. Thank you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Today is a very important day for Ukraine. Today we signed the political, uh, political part association agreement with the European Union. Almost four months ago, hundreds of thousands, millions of the people go to the street around Ukraine. 
We are able to demonstrate we want to live with European standards of life. It's enough to live with corruption, enough to live without rules, enough to live without future. And actually, today we sign a session agreement. Everybody understand, it's right now a very difficult time for Ukraine. Intervention, military intervention from, from the Russia. In this difficult time, we need support. Support of friends of Ukraine. Support of everybody who see Ukraine as modern European country. And yes, of course, from us, from Ukraine, depend our future, but with the help of our friends. And that's why I want to say thank you very much for everybody who supports Ukraine. But uh, with, with the help, we can go over this very difficult part of our history, and we go out from deep economical and political crisis in Ukraine. We want to build modern European country, and we do that. Thank you. Thank you. Just uh, three quick points. Uh, one of them is uh, I want to congratulate the German Marshall Fund. What we've seen at the conference thus far today, and I'm sure we'll see it tomorrow, is a remarkable degree of unity between the Europeans and Americans, East Europeans, about what is going on, what this crisis is, a level of outrage at Russia's invasion of Ukraine, outrage over its annexation, and a determination that uh, this cannot stand in the Europe of the 21st century. Second point, the crisis is not over. We can't talk about it today as if it's now behind us and we're cleaning up. Uh, we've seen Russia take Crimea. We worry that Russia will try to take other parts of Ukraine or will try to see places like Transnistria join the Russian Federation or South Ossetia or Abkhazia. So this crisis is not over and needs active crisis management. And that's the third point, is that despite the unity that we see, we need to see stronger action from a transatlantic community to deter that kind of Russian activity. Uh, we need to be bolder, we need to be stronger, we need to be faster. I have a question for uh, the foreign minister, Ukrainian foreign minister. Um, you signed the association agreement today. Do you think um, it's a diplomatically smart move to do that, or is that just going to antagonize Russia more and um, deepen this crisis and make it harder to find a diplomatic solution? Um, I think it's, uh, first of all, uh, we agreed to sign this uh, association agreement uh, a few weeks ago, uh, before Russia started invasion. So it will, in any case, uh, shouldn't provoke Russia, uh, because Russia has already um, invaded Ukraine. Secondly, uh, um, it was a choice of the Ukrainian people and uh, those people who have been uh, protesting against uh, postponing signing procedure. And thirdly, this uh, association agreement is the result not of only uh, three weeks' work. This uh, association agreement was on the table for years. It's uh, happened that we signed it today, but uh, during the last few years, Ukrainians and Europeans have been working hard to make it happen. And um, uh, if Russia did not uh, protest against this uh, for years, why should Russia protest it now? But uh, it's one thing. The other thing that, uh, uh, from the other point of view, it's up to Ukrainian people to decide where Ukraine want to go and has to go. And uh, the European uh, uh, choice is, um, was supported uh, by the, the 
overwhelming majority of the parliament when the parliament uh, voted for the program of a new Ukrainian government. Moreover, in the legislation, Ukrainian legislation, the membership in the European Union was supported by many previous governments. So it's the choice of Ukrainian people for many years. Hello. You said that the Interfax Ukraine is in a summer. I have my first question for all of you. Because all time we hear a political solution is the best way. Yes, this is the best way. But my question is, do you have a plan B if Russia will not stop? And what can be a plan B? Because I would like to have clear answer. And the second question is about um, political part of the association agreement and my question for mi both ministers. How do you see uh, the real implementation of this document? And what kind of uh, procedure this part of document still needed? Do we have uh, some kind of ratification? And uh, how then will be this DCFTA? Thank you. I'll try to take a bit more, more points. First of all, with regard to association agreement, the political part, as was said, uh, but it's also, uh, it should be clear that association agreement, it's a single instrument, including DCFTA, which is very important. And I hope, I know, I know that Ukrainian friends already have a meaning, meaning so to say, plan how, how to do it, because this is, as a single mechanism, is very, very useful. And of course, with regard to the DCS, DCFTA implementation, we should really take it as, a, as a necessary steps to start structural reforms, uh, to, to, to place the process as irreversible, and, and also, um, again, consider this as a single. So that's, let's, let's consider this as a single in, uh, instrument. At the same time, this signing as a big political support and the boost to Ukraine. Uh, let me also refer a bit, although I was not asked, but the question what Deutsche Welle asked, it's a very typical question. It reminds me a bit questions to Lithuania in 1990 when we declared our independence and we also asked not to provoke Soviet Union at that time. So, indeed, our task is to make a choice. Our task, of course, not to be aggressive. Our task uh, to be constructive. But it's not our task to make everyone happy, especially, especially when somebody is, is aggressive. So this is also very important to note, and I believe we shouldn't accuse Ukrainians that they did what they had to do. I will uh, briefly answer on the second question. Is, uh, um, we are planning to elaborate an action plan together with the European Union, and we do expect uh, we will, that the next week the European uh, commissioners will come, the commissioners will come to Ukraine, and we will make this plan together. Not It will be not the plan that we will be making on our own, and they will be making on our, their own. So we will make it together. And uh, for the implementation of what was signed today, and how we can reach the uh, stage to implement the other chapters of the association agreement, which were not in force, which are not in force at this moment. And uh, for the second, for the first year question, uh, the answer is very uh, straightforward. We will defend our land, the Plan B. Well, regarding Plan A, we try to find solution in diplomatic way. If it doesn't work, I just uh, return from military bases in uh, in in Ukraine. I spoke with officers, with soldiers, with people in the street, and everybody have a mood. We have to defend. It's plan B. Our country, our unity, our independence, and we're ready for that. It's our plan B. And we expect support from the people, from, who, uh, from the country who support also independence, and we know the country, United States, Great Britain, and Russia was the country guarantee of Budapest Agreement 1994. And uh, the Russia broke the agreement, and we expect reaction from another country for that. Thank you. 
Well, about the Plan B. In August 2008, Georgia responded with Plan B. It started with respond with Plan B, and we ended where we ended. And that's unfortunate lesson that one country, single country, in military confrontation with Russia is not in very good positioning. On the other hand, the war between nuclear powers should be excluded. Therefore, I would see between plan A and plan B something A minus B plus, and I do not think that the measures and tools are exhausted, and there are no other things which democratic world can use. And we heard today very important statements aired by Secretary General of NATO. And I believe that this will work. And we all will do everything to avoid the bigger disaster. At the same time, of course, every single citizen of Ukraine, as we see it, as every single citizen of Georgia and every other country, is ready to sacrifice for its homeland. But we politicians are here in order to avoid that plan B. I'll just add one point to what's already been said. I think the key word that should be on everyone's lips is deterrence. What we see right now is Russia using military force to impose its objective. And we see the United States and the European Union seeking to use other means, sanctions in particular, to impose costs on Russia for doing that and get it to stop and perhaps reverse. And thus far, Russia is not taking those particular steps very seriously. I think what we need to be thinking of is not just imposing costs, but being willing to rise to the challenge at increasing rate in order to deter Russia from taking the further steps and consolidating what it's already done. Um, I, Mark Champion from Bloomberg View. Uh, I just spent, uh, just came from a week in Donetsk. And uh, Mr. Klitschko, I know that you were there recently too. Um, and I came away with the impression, uh, put Russia aside for the moment, but there is a vacuum there. There's a vacuum in which uh, Kiev, uh, understandably, does not want to impose uh, its writ because uh, it will backfire. Um, and there are the local authorities, are the old local authorities, the old Yanukovych family loyalists and so on, who are there and the governor, the new governor is doing his best, but there is a vacuum. Um, I worry that but if you wait between now, let's imagine you win the presidency, uh, until towards the end of the year, there will be no representation for those people because you will have a government from basically the Fatherland Party, you will have uh, the Party of Regions, these people in Donetsk, they feel that, uh, yeah, they didn't like Yanukovych that much, but it was their party and they feel they're no longer represented. So how do you fix that? How do you get them involved? Um, because that's a long time to leave a vacuum open for ill wishes to do ill. Thank you for your question. <clears throat> the war is starting, starting a long time ago. Media war. Media war against Ukraine. And right now, the Russian media, uh, to translate the, uh, the information uh, <clears throat> right now to the power come people, radicals, nationalistic people, extremists, the people who don't like the Russians. I, give, I was in Donetsk and it was the east region of Ukraine and give the question to the people. I look like radicals. I look like radic uh, nationalists. I hated Russians. I am Russian speaking Ukrainian. My mom, my mother is Russian. My father is Ukrainian. My wife is half Russian, half Ukrainian. 
And uh, we don't want uh, uh, to fight against Russian, but anyway, we defend our country, we defend our independence, our unity. First point. The second point is very important to talk to the people, to explain him. The, the politician can't bring the life standards to the people. What America, East or West Ukraine, South or North Ukraine, or Central Ukraine, everybody has the same problems. But politicians try to use the old um, populistic uh, question of language, nationality, religion, history. It's work. It's work, but it's very important right now to talk to the people. And that, that's why right now in all media in Ukraine, united country. And we talk about that and we know we can change the mood. But if you, uh, if you was in uh, Donetsk, uh, it's funny. We, I meet there so many political tourists from Russia. They go around with the Russian flags and uh, they voting for the Russia. I told guys, with whole respect, Russia is a multicultural country with a lot of problems, a lot of languages, a, a lot of na uh, uh, nations. Go to the Russia and fix your problem. We can do that without the help. Main point, to talk to the people, to change the opinion, and we can do that all together. If I, if, I, if I'll add only to this, so I think that what we need in Ukraine now is more decentralization of powers and more powers to the local governments, including in Eastern Ukraine. And I think that we need to meet the needs of the people, of these people, local peoples uh, in Eastern Ukraine. But not only the needs, they uh, probably been uh, very publicly about the uh, use of Russian language, uh, it's, uh, but also the social, economic and financial uh, needs that need that has to be approved and living standards that has to be approved uh, in not only in Eastern Ukraine, but all around Ukraine. Uh, Mr. Tshitsi, I have a question to you um, concerning the last events of uh, the summit today. Uh, uh, as you know, uh, the <coughs> uh, heads of uh, states decided also about the energy um, security of uh, EU. And it has been included that um, the main point that the all EU countries will, will try to avoid uh, Russian pipes and um, to um, try to avoid the uh, dependence of uh, uh, of uh, Russian uh, energy uh, supplement like gas uh, and fuel. So they, it has been described the picture that the main point would be on the uh, Azerbaijan, Turkmenistan, through the uh, sea up to the uh, other. So I did ask uh, Mr. Barroso. Okay, Mr. Barroso, now the, uh, our pipe, our uh, energetical system is the main system of the whole Europe. If the uh, tube would be empty, what Ukraine would, uh, will do, how you can uh, protect us in this case? This is, it's the first question. You got it? Yeah? So, oh, because we can be one to one of... And the second question, sorry, uh, the second question uh, uh, concerning that you uh, told very confirmly that we don't have any means and um, any tools to cooperate with NATO to be protected uh, by NATO because we don't have just uh, from, from the, uh, your conference. But I should remind you that we signed the agreement partnership for, uh, 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 for SHIP uh, uh, for a partnership for peace, and the second was it. Uh, uh, so you didn't tell it, oh. and so and so we had the last point of uh, uh, negotiations between yeah yeah negotiations between NATO and uh, Ukraine. It was the um, uh, distinctive uh, dialogue about protection, etc. So we can somehow to provide further dialogue about our uh, plan, uh, 
um, for membership. With NATO, you probably misunderstood. Uh, the, what I was saying is the intensive dialogue and cooperation with NATO on the basis of the existing uh, legislation. Uh, uh, and uh, we are not talking about the military presence of NATO in Ukraine, so, but we are talking about military and political cooperation with Ukraine and uh, about the assistance from NATO. So it uh, probably was misunderstood by you. But with the um, uh, gas supply, uh, we have to start uh, implementing and not talking the pro, uh, not talking about the the, the okay oil gas. Uh, we have to start implementing uh, the projects on uh, diversification of uh, natural um, uh, resources to Ukraine and uh, of the supply of natural resources to Ukraine, and also about the alternative sources of. Uh, uh, energy, but we have to start this. And one thing that is very important, uh, therefore, I think for the European audience, that Russia is not uh, giving gas to Europe. Russia is selling gas to Europe, and this money that then, uh, which European nations uh, or governments are paying or private companies are paying to Russia, goes to Russia. And then the Russia subsidized this, the military um, uh, arsenals uh, in Russia. That military arsenal that is, it is used against Ukraine and against Europe. So it's, it's a cycle that we might break. Thank you. Oh, hi, Ian Trainer from The Guardian. A question for the two foreign ministers and perhaps for a comment from Mr. Falker as well. Um, the uh, association agreement with the European Union was ready for full signing in November in Vilnius. Why today is it only partly available for signing, in your view? Why only political now? Ah. Okay, with the, with the uh, DCFTA, with the freight free agreement, it was not signed uh, today because we need some time to improve economic situation in Ukraine and to make sure that the Ukrainian uh, um, uh, enterprises and people will not be affected with this uh, free trade uh, zone. But uh, from the other side, and probably Linus will tell more, the European Union unilaterally agreed to um, uh, uh, take away the barriers and tariffs for the Ukrainian uh, products for which uh, might be exported to the uh, uh, European market. So I think it's, uh, we need simply some time to stabilize the economy in Ukraine, and then we'll be ready to implement this part of the association agreement. Oh, just, just one word. Yeah. About lifting tariffs, it was said by Andre, uh, it's, it's indeed true, but also it's, it's true that this is, uh, as, as we understand, will be immediately addressed. So it's not a big pause between these. It really should, should, should take place quite uh, in the foreseeable future and uh, with the all, also to say, in-depth analysis. And it was upon respect of our Ukrainian friends. So that, but nevertheless, having said this, I would remind you that this is considered as a single instrument uh, anyway. This was the last question, yeah? Oh. My, I, have one. One more. I don't know how this works. Oh, it's really quick. Um, well, except that I'm trying to understand Brooks's question. Um, do you all consider that Crimea is gone? I mean, because, Kurt, you mentioned that, that this, this is an active crisis that needs maintaining, but, I mean, nobody is talking about actually anything that would make Russia reverse. You're just talking about trying to deter it from going fo forward. Is it, as people have said, a fait accompli? Is there any way to get Crimea back? Does it, or is, is it gone for good? And if Russia annexes Transnistria and demands stronger transit rights, what will you do? Because the rest of it was too complicated. I, I don't give you a directly answer. But uh, in my answer, you find the answer. <laughs> It's difficult to believe to take right now the Crimea back. I don't see exactly a way. 
right now. But the way what we have to do it now, I know. In very short period of time, we have it to change Ukraine economy, destroy corruption, make reform, and to make high social standards in Ukraine. Rebuild our infrastructure. This will be a good example for everyone in Crimea who was in uh, unlegitimate unleg uh, in, 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 in uh, uh, referendum. Thank you for your help. Uh, <laughs> And it will be a good example for that uh, to show they make a mistake. We can do that. And we have good example like Poland, Czech Republic, Slovak Republic. They make good steps and we in a good way. It's uh, my personal opinion. It will be very clearly in good way. We need for that not so much time, a couple of years. We want millions of Ukrainians want to change this and want to live in modern European democratic country. Um, I will answer on your second question uh, first. Um, it's happened that, uh, that uh, I have, or oh, it's actually, yes, yours. Yeah, it's happened that I have an experience of dealing with the protracted conflicts in the OSC area. My previous position was a special representative of the chairperson in office, OEC chairperson in office for conflicts. So last year, I've been traveling to uh, Nagorno Karabakh, uh, Ossetia, Abkhazia, Transnistria. So uh, I learned a little bit uh, how to avoid mistakes. Uh, but the situation in Transnistria is a big concern. It's not only for Ukraine, not only for Moldova, but it's a big concern and should be a big concern for Europe. If Russia decides to connect Transnistria with the Crimea and Abkhazia, making a corridor uh, which will create a very destabilizing uh, zone in Europe. So we all have to think about this and look on the map and avoid this. And answering on your question about the Crimea, it's not gone, at least for Ukraine, it's not gone. We consider Ukra Crimea as the integral part of Ukraine, and um, nobody believed that uh, in 1961, when the Berlin Wall was erected, that it would be destroyed in one day or night, uh, in uh, how many, 30 years, maybe. I believe that it will take less time to destroy uh, the uh, escalation and military presence in Crimea. And I have a very uh, a hope and believe and wish to have one of these uh, Brussels forums in the Crimea. Oh, well, to, to clarify, in the Ukrainian Crimea. <laughs>